This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and it never got quiet. This is a half hour program that explores the Hawaiian connection with the Vietnam War. I'm your host, Vic Kraft. It seems that every outfit in the military has its own Radar O'Reilly. Call them grave robbers, gophers, or scroungers. There are one or two people in the organization that circumvent normal channels to get things done. Not all of them have higher motives. Today our guest will describe for us his fictional account of one man who manages to manipulate the system for his own benefit and along the way actually does some good by accident. He has written a book titled Loveless in the Knob. Our guest is retired U.S. Army Colonel and author Jim Borsma. Jim is a graduate of Michigan State majoring in journalism. He also attended the University of Michigan, the prestigious Sophia University in Tokyo, and the U.S. Army Command and Staff College. Jim has been an, in an integral part of Hawaii politics, having worked on several successful campaigns and also as the Director of Communications for the Governor's Office and the Hawaii State Senate. He's held several command and staff positions during his career, both on active duty and in the reserves. Jim is a partner in the marketing firm of Star Siegel McCombs. He has also served a number of community activities and societies, among them Pacific Historic Parks, which oversees the Arizona Memorial, Diamond Head, and three other national parks. Aloha, Jim, and welcome to the program. Aloha, Vic. In my family, attending Michigan State and uh, going to Michigan would probably uh, end you up in a court of appeals. <laughs> uh, it's, it's dangerous territory. Uh, uh, amongst other things, uh, we had one of our nieces marry a guy from Ohio State, and uh, during the reception, the Ohio State people were on one side of the room and the Michigan State people were on the other. Yeah. So uh, uh, I don't know how you managed to do it and survive, but uh, that seems like an accomplishment in itself. Well, I, I went to Michigan State right after I graduated from high school and then spent four, four years there mm -hmm. getting my degree in journalism. And then it was some years later, in fact, over a decade later, I was assigned with the Army near the Pentagon with Soldiers Magazine. And University of Michigan had a, an off-campus type of school that you can enroll in, and I worked there for took classes there for about a year and a half, got my master's in business administration. So, okay, we'll forgive you then. So <laughs> I did it because it was going to help me and my family, I think. <laughs> Well, your, your time in Vietnam, uh, you were attached to what? Uh, I was with the AmeriCal Division, uh, underneath which was, uh, there was three brigades. I was with the 196th Infantry Brigade, which mm -hmm. is now stationed right up here at Schofield Barracks yeah. uh, in, at, trip, at uh, Fort Chapter. And then I was with Bravo Company of the 2nd Infantry, 2nd of the 1st Infantry. So you were essentially a, a, a private uh, hump on the boonies? I was drafted in the summer of 68, went through basic training and AIT, advanced individual training, and then was shipped to Vietnam and uh, somehow ended up in the infantry. <laughs> I, I didn't expect that to happen, but because I had a college degree. But I ended up being an infantryman, I ended up being the RTO, that's the radio guy that mm -hmm. carries the thing on his back. Plus carrying a weapon and Plus having Plus the to, weapon and, and yeah. I, you know, 
I carried food and ammunition and blankets and all kinds of stuff. I probably carried 70 or 80 pounds on my back when you added the radio on. Yeah. But actually, the radio probably saved my life once. I got blown off the back of a tank, slammed into a tree with my back, and it cracked. The radio was about this big. It cracked the radio. Mm -hmm. But I could still go get up and walk. <laughs> so, <laughs> you sent a letter to the manufacturer, I hope. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, that, uh, we, we laugh about those things now, and as, as, at the time it happened, it wasn't that funny. No, it wasn't funny at all. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what year uh, were you in country? I got to Vietnam in the spring of 69 and left in the spring of 70. From the, I would say from late April, early May, I was out in the infantry, and I stayed there until the fall, at which point uh, I ended up getting a job back in the rear as a with special correspondence unit. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I think because I had a degree in journalism, and I, you know, you talk and meet people and stuff. And anyway, I ended up going back there, and I was uh, assigned with about five other people. And we answered congressional inquiry letters, which we didn't sign. <laughs> Commanders did. Right. And we also wrote the letters to next of kin for people who had been shot and killed. That had to have been and a that, very of course, depressing. Went, that yeah. went to the commanding general who had signed those, of course, yeah. 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 yeah and uh, did you ever manage to get to Phuket? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Never got to Phuket. You were there. Or Queen Yan in that area? I, I, I spent so much time out in the, in the, on you know LZs, like LZ Baldy and Hawk Hill and those things. And, mm -hmm. And we were the northernmost army unit. The Marines were just north of us. And right. in fact, there were several large battles that we took part in, which the Marines and the army were together going in to do things because of our location. That would be a revelation. <laughs> the army no, we were, and the we Marines were, we were friends. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't a lot of friendly fire. There's no such thing as friendly fire. <laughs> Well, let's get into your book as far as Loveless in the Nam and just hold it up here and let folks see it. Uh, let's see if I, here we go. You've created this character, uh, fictional, and uh, I asked you once before, I hope this isn't an autobiographical. <laughs> no, no, this, this is a character. Uh, the events in the book are real events. Most of them, most of them are real events, took part during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. uh, but the character's made up, and he's, if you, if you read the book, you'll, you'll see real clearly, he's a, he's a coward and a liar, and he doesn't want to, he never wanted to go to Vietnam, never wanted to go in the Army, but he ended up getting drafted and sent over there, and he ends up being a prisoner of war at one point, which is his own fault, because he, <laughs> he tries to escape from a battle zone by faking the heat casually, and they put him in a helicopter, fly him out, he gets shot down, he gets captured. <laughs> so, and throughout the book, there are things like that. Where, but it's all based on real events and things, and, and I'm very complimentary, I think, of the of the soldiers and the units that are that are involved in. Yeah. So, yeah. but but the guy himself's a character, and yeah, I've I've started a second book called Loveless and the Rising Sun, and I've got a third and a fourth planned for this guy's so-called career. <laughs> well, I, I'm I, I'm anxious to get into it to read about it, but uh, uh, you said it's based on uh, incidents. Hopefully, they weren't ex your experience. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, you know the idea of uh, well the, the biggest battle of 1969 was Hiep Duc Hill, which is up near Chu Lai in, in the northern part of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And again, the Marines and the Army were both into that, and this character is involved with that battle. Hmm. What what month was that? Do you recall? That would have been August of 69. Okay. Yeah. And then I. I Faked it. I mean, President Nixon made one visit to Vietnam during the war. When mm -hmm. He had an award ceremony. He was only in the country like 10 hours, but this guy gets a fake award and he ends up in, standing in line. And, but he gets brought in at the last minute so that in the real news cycle, people wouldn't have known he was there. But at the last yeah. minute, the Army brings him in. But the president pins a medal on him and the president moves on down the line to the next guy and the medal falls off. <laughs> <laughs> Which it should have done. Karma. <laughs> Karma. <laughs> well, it, it, I don't want you to give away the plot of the book uh, because, uh, as I said, I'm anxious to get into it to see uh, how this guy fares and uh, maybe I can even learn something from him. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the Army offers awful, an awful lot of opportunities it, to. He did uh, go to Michigan State, I'll admit that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, heck. 
How did you, how did you come upon creating this particular character? I mean, just uh... I read I read a series of books um, called about a, a British soldier during the 1800s mm -hmm. called Flashman series, and he fought in China and in, in India and all kinds of places like because the British were all around the world in those right. days, and uh, I just thought it was really. Unique. Those those books sold really well, and the characters kind of unique. And I just thought, you know, maybe let me try something. <laughs> and I've, I've had a lot of good compliments and got good reviews on this. I haven't promoted it really well, so it sells just so so. I think you know, you can no. get it on Amazon. You can get it. You can go online and get it at Barnes and Noble, but it's not expensive. But no, we'll uh, see. Uh, my sales haven't done all that well either. If you got to remember. Uh, 4,000 books are published daily, so uh, yeah. you're throwing your hat in the ring with an awful lot of other hats. So, That's right. Yeah. So y you left Vietnam. Uh, you you said you were a draftee. I was uh, a draftee, yes. But uh, you, you didn't stay in the field all the time while you were there. No, towards the end, like I said, they, they uh, you're, once about every third week or so, we would be back at July and we'd get a couple days break and stuff. Mm -hmm. I ended up talking to people, and, and somebody found out I had a degree in journalism, and then, then they, I got contacted and said, there's going to be an opening in this office. Would you be willing to come there and do that? And I said, sure, what the heck, get me out of the infantry. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> it couldn't be any worse, right? And, and actually, at Chu Lai, it was a big a big military base and had a yeah. runway, and you know, a, the ocean was there, the beach was there. It, was, it wasn't a bad place at all. Once in a while, I got some rockets coming in, but that's all. Yeah. And... Uh, so I just kind of volunteered to go there and work there. And then when I left Vietnam, I still had about half a year on my draft no time in, or a little less than that maybe. And I, you know, I said, they asked me where would you like to go since you were infantry and you got CIB and a couple of medals. I said, well, where can I go in journalism? So I ended up going to Stars and Stripes in Tokyo. And I only wore a uniform one day a week, so I didn't really feel like I was in the Army. And I just I re-enlisted twice and just stayed. And, was a journalist. So they give you consecutive overseas tours in, in Tokyo yeah, all that time? basically. Well, I was in Tokyo or, and then at Camp Zama, which was the Army headquarters to the south of Tokyo. Mm -hmm. No, I, I want to thank you because uh, you were the highlight of the week for most of us uh, in, in Vietnam. When Stars and Stripes came out, uh, it was fought over. Oh, everybody wanted to read it. Yeah. Oh, sure. And it was uh, probably one of the better pieces of journalism that was ever done. I think back in those days it was, you know, yeah. Stars and Stripes was all over all over Asia, wherever yeah. our military was. Yeah, and I, I think of uh, the history of the uh, of Stars and Stripes in all theaters. Uh, you know, as you know, Bill Malden, uh, the great writer and uh, cartoon political cartoonist yeah. of uh, the fifties and sixties, uh, he wrote up front, and he was also uh, a writer for Stars and Stripes. Oh. But uh, it's uh, yeah, it was a very reputable publication. Not just among GIs, but I think amongst uh, everybody. Yeah. So you, you stayed six years there, or so, or so oh, in Tokyo. Close to eight years. Close to eight years. In, in Japan, uh, yeah. And what did you do? Then uh, I, I had a year left, and they assigned me to Soldiers Magazine, which was the Army's monthly publication. That was over at Washington, D.C., so I went there and was a writer for about nine or ten months. I can't remember exactly. And then I got off active duty, and my family and I moved back here to Hawaii. And I, since I already had like almost 12 years, of Hawaii, you know, I joined the National or the Army Reserve, figuring I'd get my 20 in. But when I was in Army Reserve here in the 80s and 90s, it was hard, it wasn't any real big wars. I mean, we had that one in in uh, the mid East in the late or the early 90s, but you know, hardly anybody from here went to that. So being in the Army Reserve, you, you, you really networked well in town. It was a good part-time job, and plus I was saving my time for retirement. Mm -hmm. and, and I was a first lieutenant when I came back here, so I just stayed in and stayed in. And then in uh, 2001, I got promoted to full colonel. So that was, you know, a pretty good way to try to retire. Then December of 03, I got called back to active duty. Because you know we went into Afghanistan in late '02 and then into Iraq in '03, and I brought up several hundred soldiers from the reserves with me. I was, we were placed in charge of the training and the equipping and, and for the deployment for the entire Pacific Basin. So the Pentagon would say, okay, this group from Guam, they're going to go to Afghanistan this date. 
this group from Hawaii, they're going to Iraq, and this group's going, and they would tell us where they're going, but then we would do all of the training, get all of the equipment mm -hmm. that we could, and ship them off, and we'd make sure their families were all okay while they were gone. And then, of course, at the end of the year, we'd bring them back and have a big special ceremony to welcome them all back. Yeah, great, outstanding. Yeah, yeah I, I, I want to talk a little bit more uh, about that, but uh, uh, first, uh, let's go ahead and take a break here and uh, listen to these messages. Okay. Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Welcome back. Uh, we're talking with Jim Borsma, uh, retired U.S. Army colonel and uh, author, and uh, we were just uh, talking on the break here about uh, about Vietnam and motives and doing things correctly. Uh, as you and I were talking earlier, Jim, uh, our group uh, that meets on Monday nights, we were talking about the training involved and, and being prepared, and it seemed as though uh, the recruit of the Army back in the 60s was rushed into combat. <laughs> and you were talking about uh, grabbing units from various places within the Pacific region and sending them into uh, Iraq, and, Iraq and Afghanistan. And you had mentioned the idea of training. Yeah. I, I'm wondering how much better prepared they were than... Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of example. Yeah. Up at Schofield Barracks, we had a fake village, mm -hmm. like in Iraq, Right. <laughs> they would train in that. But we had one time we would show a movie about a convoy, and we'd say, now this is how you have to set up your convoy. This is up front, this is in the back, this is, you know, and we'd show them that, that and say, so if you're ambushed, this is how you would react and stuff. And then a couple days later, we'd have a convoy of those guys driving somewhere and we'd ambush them. <laughs> and see how they would react based on what they'd seen on the screen. You see? Yeah, yeah. So we really, really wanted the details about the training. Now, some a lot of that came from the from the Pentagon area. They came over to us and said, "Here, try this, do this," and so we did. And it, and it's like I said, Schofield, the commanding general at the time, had had everything set up for it really well. well I wonder how successful it was because I think of the uh, uh, you know, the lessons learned type of thing. Well, and the funny funny thing is this too. The 196 Light Infantry Brigade that I fought for in Vietnam was called to active duty about three years before I got sent up to Schofield Barracks. And they were the, actually, we, our, our company was in charge of the soldiers, equipping them, sending them to classes and all this, but the 196 was actually doing the physical training with them. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> if you're in the Army and you, you're assigned to a unit, you wear their patch on your left shoulder. Right. If you're in an army and you're in a combat unit, you wear it on your right shoulder. Right. I was the only guy at Schofield with that 196 patch on the right <laughs> shoulder. And I, lots of people said, sir, you got the patch on the wrong shoulder. And I said, no, I was infantry in Vietnam in 196. Yeah. So it was a very strange thing. But we worked with them a lot and it, it was very thorough training. Yeah, and we went to Vietnam. We had we got trained on how to shoot the weapons. That was about it. Yeah, and and I'm wondering if if that contributed to the casualty rate at all. I I don't know. You know, I, I didn't fight in Iraq or Afghanistan. In Vietnam, I could tell you it was very horrendous at times. Mm -hmm. Very very difficult. I I remember we 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 got called once to go rescue a, a unit, 
in northern Vietnam, and we went in there, and then they called unit after unit after unit, and we ended up having like several thousand American troops in there trying to rescue this, these guys, and we did, most of them. But we fought the, the NVA, the national, you know, not the Viet Cong. I might have been Viet Cong there too, but the NVA was there. Now we drove them out of this place, but then, of course, we all pulled back, and then we were told two weeks later they're back on this hill again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, what did we go all do that huge battle for, you know? Yeah. Take land and then, then give it right back to them in, in a way. So it was a strange kind of war. Yeah. Uh, several of our guests previously have mentioned that, that uh, you know, no clear objectives, uh, the way it was prosecuted, which is another thing uh, I think uh, we bring up today. Uh, this morning in New York City, there was uh, a terrorist uh, action. Or, oh, was there? Yeah, and uh, several people were killed. And y y you gotta wonder, I recall one of my mentors mentioning that uh, we were gonna go about this all wrong, all, all wrong after 9-11. That we're gonna gear up the military and do all these things and go after these people, and perhaps maybe that's not the way we should be doing it. Mm. Uh, we went after, uh, we went into Vietnam with the idea that we were going to prevent the domino theory. Uh, that worked real well. And we'd been through Korea and we said, oh, we can at least do that, and we'll have a north yeah. and a south. You yeah, see. but uh, it, was, it was a completely different war, and, and the way we prosecute war is different. And uh, again, that gets into the training, and unfortunately, as you said, you were getting the feedback from the Pentagon. And, and how to do these things and how to train people for their particular for the environment. Iraq and yeah. Afghanistan, we did. We had really good support. In fact, the more recent governor, Neil Abercrombie, was a congressman at the time. He came over and gave a speech up on the stage there and was asking questions. And a couple of troops were there. said, Sir, we're not getting enough, am enough equipment and the kind mm -hmm. of stuff that we need. And he said, You know what? I'm going to make sure you get that. And he did. <laughs> And when he ran in 2010 for governor, they made, a, they made a TV spot for him and had soldiers coming up saying, hey, thanks, he did this, he did this for us. And, and it's true. We were having a hard time getting all the right equipment right at first, but then, then it came. Yeah. And, and that's critical as far, as far as people being in the field. You want to have them well-trained and also equipped properly. Well, and I was, we were shipping off National Guard and Army Reserve guys that I'd known 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of my friends were going overseas there. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think of, uh, as you said, your responsibility in terms of uh, determining what unit goes where and uh, the people that were selected for these positions. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you're looking at their training records to make sure that uh, everything is uh, well, and we even ticked up. We even set up a medical facility so people that had mental, physical, or even emotional problems would stay behind until we felt they were ready to go. Mm -hmm. Catch up to their unit, yeah. And it was we were very thorough on it. No, they they, they, they went as units, or the, yeah, the, the unit would go. But you know, if let's say there's 200 guys, maybe two or three might stay behind because one of them might have had pneumonia. I don't mm -hmm. know. They could have had a, an illness, or they could have got hurt during training, so they couldn't walk or run. So we'd mm -hmm. keep them behind until they were physically ready to go. Mm -hmm. Then they'd catch up, you know, a couple weeks later to their unit. But but they went as a unit, both going in and coming out. Yes, ah. almost always they went as units come in. So yes. when they came back, we had a big like a basketball arena, we'd march them into there, and you know all the families are up in the stands <laughs> waiting for them. That's great. That's for great. their soldiers <laughs> to come back. Uh, that's a heck of a lot better than what we got when we came back oh, from Vietnam. Yeah, no, we got yeah. nothing coming back from Vietnam. <laughs> Yeah. But I will say the public nowadays is a lot more accommodating and treating Vietnam veterans much better than 40 years ago. That was, a, I was going to get into that. There are some people who have uh, made the comment that uh, civilians don't have the attachment to the military that uh, they used to. Uh, partially because of the draft. Yeah. Uh, we don't have little Johnny in uniform anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's a professional force. Uh, and what you're saying, yeah, of course, you may have reservists and National Guard members uh, going and doing these jobs, yeah. and uh, they're probably far better, better prepared than their, their drafty counterparts from uh, 50 years ago. But it's still uh, a pressure, yeah. and still, uh, you know, are you doing the job right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's 
what do you think? I mean, from your experience and from your position, do we have a better trained army today? I think that a lot of emphasis is being put on training, yeah. And I think in the last 10 years, we're being much more careful about trying to get into conflicts. I, I don't think the army is, or our military is looking for wars. No. They're, they're there to defend this country, yeah. which we want, which we need. You know, but I, I don't think we're looking to get into wars. Uh, you know, we went into Vietnam. I mean, that Ken Burns movie he maybe is going to say that Ho Chi Minh actually wrote letters to President Truman and Eisenhower saying, "Hey, you know, the, the the British left India after World War II. You guys left the Philippines. Why are you letting the French come back into our country? You know, ask yeah. them to leave so we yeah. have our own country and our own independence. Yeah, he, he we didn't it. support. Yeah. We ended up yeah. going into yeah. a war there that yeah. we never really fought right. I don't think." And, yeah. and there was a lot of criticism about Iraq, too, you know? Sure. Afghanistan, yeah. bin Laden's there, they hit us on 9-11, go get him. <laughs> we all, all yeah. understood that, but yeah. I had very senior military people come to me and say, look, we don't all agree on Iraq, but we follow the orders of our commander-in-chief, so. Yeah, that's true. It. And so that's what we yeah. did. Jim, I wanna thank you very much for being here and uh, telling us about your book. Journalism is not objective, no matter how hard we try. We all carry some amount of prejudice towards a topic. However, there can be alternative journalism where an issue can be discussed without rhetoric or animosity. I believe that is what we have to offer here at Think Tech Hawaii. This media offers an opportunity to bring more than one perspective to the community. Think Tech also provides information on a host of topics that can aid in improving your life. But all this costs money. We speak of free speech as one of our rights in our Constitution, but it requires maintenance. That maintenance has been measured in the lives of those who have defended it and by those who support such efforts as Think Tech Hawaii through their contributions. The staff here are not volunteers and they would like to continue to pay their rent. The hosts of the programs you watch are volunteers. We do this out of service to the community, so please contribute. You can find uh, a way to con contribute at www.thanksforthinktech.causebox.com. We would love to have some feedback. If you have comments, please send an email to 808vietnamvets at gmail.com. I would like to thank the staff here at Think Tech Hawaii for all their support and assistance. Special thanks go to Ray and Robert who go the extra mile. Truly without them, this program would not be possible. Please come back again next week for another issue of It Never Got Quiet. Mahalo.